All right, so we're going to get started uh, today. Pretty good turnout. I'm actually kind of surprised. It's usually about half, and you guys are above average, so I'll take it, okay? Um, I have a bunch of the portfolios out. I put them out last class, but I'll leave them out through today so you can look at the previous samples. I think most of those are A's and B's. It's possible that some of the other ones slipped in, but I try not to show those so that you guys can see the, the better ones. Um, for those of you that are in industrial design, there may be a few in there. I try every semester to have, but I don't have a lot of, to pick from. And some of the really good ones that have gone past, they kept. Uh, so it is what it is. Um, but you can look through, and then, of course, you can look online to, to see other options. Um, today, we're going to talk portfolios. You're going to have a lot of time in class today to work on your portfolio, which is a good thing, given how much time we have left in the semester. So I want you to take that time and really think about it. I'm going to lecture about the cover and the binding options and how you're going to bind it today. You may or may not elect to work on the cover. I suggest that you work on the cover in the, uh, in the handout, but if you want to work on the layout, that's OK, too. I'm perfectly OK. It's, it's basically it's a day to work on your portfolio. It's a day to ask me questions and that sort of thing. So um, let's go through portfolio covers. What belongs on the cover in the first place? Well, number one, it needs to have your name on it. And I think that's the one thing that is a standard, you have to put your name on it. Um, if you don't put your name on it, you have no idea whose portfolio it is. So it's, it's a good idea to put your name on it at least somewhere. Even in Alex Holgraf's example, it's all black with the volume four on the side. There's a tiny little piece where his name is. So there's always that name. Now, what else do you put on it? You could put things like portfolio, design portfolio, uh, industrial design portfolio, whatever. Selected works, it's kind of all in that theme. Some people like to put that sort of thing. Some people don't. In some instances, you have requirements, like if you're applying for the master's program at Berkeley, you have to say what candidate status you are. So like for me, when I applied to go to grad school, it was Grant Adams option two candidate, because I was an option two candidate. So sometimes there's other things that you end up having to put on there. But for your purposes today, this is kind of a generic portfolio. You might hand it to a job. You might hand it to a school. It's just this is where I am in school right now. This is my work. So you're probably not putting something specific on it. But you could put selected works or a portfolio or, or whatever. But again, that's up to you. It's a personal preference. It could just be your name. And I'll show you some examples with just that. Uh, some people also like to include a year or a date range. Uh, in the case of Alex Holgraf's here, he has volumes, volume one, volume two, volume three, et cetera. Um, it's kind of all the same thing. Remember that portfolio is a living document. It should only contain projects that you've done in the last three to five years or so. That, that changes a little bit when you get in, in your career a little bit further along, because you might want to include certain projects uh, as you go forward. But generally speaking, it's three to five years is what you're looking at in terms of your projects. So um, having a year or a date range can sometimes solidify, hey, this is the work I've done in this time frame. But again, that's optional. So examples, I've broken these into three categories. The first category is text only. And I'm a little loose with the definition. Like this one has a little bit of a logo next to it. But the idea here is that it's dominated by just text. That's the big, that's the big piece of it. You're focused on the text. And you're, you're then uh, you know, reading what it has to say. So typically, that text would be your name and or something like architecture portfolio. Another example here, very simple, very plain. And that's, that's perfectly reasonable. Obviously, typography, font choice matters. So you want to make sure you're not picking uh, you know, Comic Sans, for example, <laughs> to pick on. Or Papyrus. Don't you dare pick Papyrus. Sometimes uh, people add little signatures or little initials or whatever, some handwriting. I think this one is really nicely done. My signature and handwriting does not look that elegant, so I would never put mine on there. So, just because you like the idea, if your initials or handwriting isn't attractive or flowy or it doesn't look like that, don't do it. Does that make sense? So don't just say, oh, I like the idea. Let me throw my signature on there. If it's really attractive, then yeah, maybe it works. If it's not, skip it. Still dominated by text. This one feels more like a web page to me. And interestingly enough, he's a web designer. So somehow that relates together. Um, but it's, it's certainly an option. The name is right there. What? 
Yeah, it is there. It is there. I told you it was a requirement. So the name is there. Uh, would I choose to do this on my portfolio? Probably not. I think your name should probably be a little bit bigger in the hierarchy. But again, that's, a, that's more of a personal preference as you go forward. So we've got color in this one. A lot of the other ones have been plain. We move from just the plain text to text with an abstract background behind it. And so this is a background that is not something that's specific to your work. It's something that maybe you created. It's a drawing that you did. It's a model that you made. But it just kind of lives there. You don't know what it is. So in this case, it's a perfect example. You've got the, the, the candidate's name or the person's name, design portfolio, and you have this kind of shadowy thing going on. So we don't know what projects it's related to. We're not seeing anything specific in the design process, but it's giving a little taste of the kinds of things he might be interested in going forward. Same kind of thing here with the twisting shape, just kind of a background graphic. This one was probably trendy in about 2008 or so. Um, you know, could you do something like this in, in uh, Photoshop or whatever? Sure, sure, that's fine. I don't mind the ink splot so much. It's the, the wrinkled paper with the drop shadow sticking on top. It's just like, yeah, it's a little dated. So remember in a portfolio, it's a document that you're going to be working with and, and having live with you for a while. You probably don't want something that ends up being too dated 10 years later. Another example here, this is just like a texture. It's a brushed metal texture. Um, this might be a little challenging to print, depending on the quality of the printer. The other thing I like to point out is the font choice is very, very thin. And it works on a projector that's this big, that's bright. We could still read it. But if you were to print this, it would not turn out. All those, all those would get muddled together. You wouldn't see enough clarity. So be aware that it's different whether you're looking at it online or whether you're looking at it uh, in print form. For our purposes in this class, you are required to print it. I will look at the print version of it. So it's really important that you think about that, that print quality at the end and, and what it looks like. I think portfolios are kind of an interesting thing because there's still a certain physicality to them. There's still a certain assumption that you could have a printed portfolio and hand it to somebody. Um, we're moving in the direction of the online portfolios. People are saying, hey, just email me your portfolio. Let me see it in a PDF, and they skip through it that way. So we're going that direction, but there's still something to that physical document, that book that you can hand somebody. Uh, and so something like this might not turn out as well in book form. So this is another thing people do with words. So this obviously says portfolio and the person's name. I have no idea who this is. If you're out there in the ether, I'm sorry I'm ripping your work apart, but it is the way it is. So I find this incredibly difficult to read. Like graphically, it's interesting, but okay, poor, oh, is that a T? Full, full, the, oh, oh yeah, it says portfolio. But it's, there's a lot of concentration involved. I mean, there, there isn't even a, a little tiny break here or here to, des, to designate that they're different letters. It just kind of all runs together. So be aware that doing something creative like this might make it more difficult for the person reading it. And the person reading it, the last thing you want to do is on the cover say, oh, that's, that's awful. Toss it to the side. Remember, in a portfolio, you're applying for a job. You're applying to grad school. You're applying to, uh, or they're reviewing it to pick what studio you're going to be in at Berkeley. They don't have time to sit and look at every portfolio for 10 minutes. They're never going to spend that amount of time. They're literally going to spend about 30 seconds looking at your portfolio. Maybe you get a minute. That's it. So cover, critical. Grab their attention. First page, awesome. Second page, wow, this looks great. Third page, OK, that's pretty good. Flip, 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 flip. Last page, nice. Good pile, bad pile, right? <laughs> that's, that's about all you get. So you have to think about it in that context. What are you giving somebody in that short read? Obviously, you want it to read if somebody's looking at it for a longer period of time. And maybe you get in a, in a job interview. Maybe they give it that for a cursory look. And then they break it into piles and say, hey, this is the one that deserves a little bit longer look. I know in grad school, um, during the application process, I'm using that because it's a pretty a good example of the kind of, uh, of application processes that you're going to end up going through as you go forward. But in grad school, what they would do is uh, for at Berkeley, when I was there, every, every year they gave away, let's say, 20 spots to students. And they'd have somewhere in the neighborhood of 5,000 people apply to them to maybe 10,000 people apply to them. So 
very small odds at getting in. Lots of portfolios to look through, right? So the people, the faculty that were on the, the, the board that was deciding who got in, they didn't look at all 5,000 portfolios. I can promise you that. So what they do is they get grad students and they say, hey, here's a group of 50 portfolios. Look through them and tell us which ones are good that are worth looking at. So they'd get that big stack of portfolios and people would look through and look through and look through. Yeah, this is the good stack. Here's about 10. And then you'd whittle down and somebody else would look through that stack and whittle it down. So you see how it keeps going. So you need to be able to impress somebody quickly and easily with your portfolio. That's how you get moved on. So another example here, kind of abstract building. If you did this as a background, you're presenting yourself as a more technical person. I want to do working drawings, not necessarily design work. So you want to think about what it is in the background. Even though the background doesn't matter because it's just background, it's giving an impression of who you are and what your interests might be. This one actually is made out of metal. So binding that might be a little bit challenging. You can see there's some screws and whatever. Just the, kind of the abstract background. I have, to, I have to pick on this one a little bit too because, and my iPad's not charged, otherwise I'd draw on the, on the screen. But, okay, so we've, we've got the abstract background. We've kind of done the rule of thirds. This is happening on the third. Okay, so compositionally, it's reasonable. And maybe I'd move this down if I were doing it, but fine. This space and this space are different. Furthermore, this and this are different. So right off the bat, as soon as I read your name, I'm going, wow, your attention to detail isn't there. So how you present it is really important because you're giving me an impression, and I'm saying me in a global sense because in, in your case, I'm evaluating you, but it could be an employer, it could be anybody else. You're giving them an, a sense of who you are and what your attention to detail might be. That's really important. So this one is the abstract photograph background with kind of the grungy concrete texture in it. Uh, there's a certain material nature to it, and I think it's, it's pretty nice. This might be more for urban design planning. Lo and behold, yep, there it is, because we're using kind of the cityscape as the backdrop. I would hope that this line, this flow line, continued through the rest of the portfolio that we'd see that same flow line. So there's a clue on the cover as to what's coming inside. This one's oddly satisfying. I have no idea what the person and the blocks mean, but it's just kind of interesting. Compositionally, it's kind of interesting. The, the text against the, uh, the, the little composition of random shapes and blocks, and then the random person that's standing down there. It's just kind of unique. I think this one is an actual um, cover that goes all the way around. So we've got a spine in the middle as it, as it folds around. I'm not quite sure why it has a barcode on it. <laughs> Such is life. I mean, you know, some people, like Alex Holgraf does sell his portfolio as example work. Um, and so maybe that's, that's why, it, why it belongs there. Um, I've seen this one uh, done kind of in a trendy manner. It was, it was popular for a while where you did a cityscape of some kind and then your work was down below as an architecture portfolio. In fact, I have a couple examples of the same kind of thing. Um, I, eh, I, I, it, it's not the best in my opinion, but it is an example. Here's an Alex Holgraf. I think he does a great job. You can look at his website to see kind of his portfolios and, and how he divides up the background um, and emphasize certain certain pieces of it, which pieces become gray, which pieces become black. Uh, it's, it's a pretty dynamic portfolio. He has several versions of it. This is what it looks like folded flat. So you can kind of get an idea of what it would look like if it wrapped all the way around your particular piece. So examples, this set is all going to be with some kind of a, a work or a project, something that, that the person did that's showcasing who they are. And so it's set up a little bit differently than the other ones. And one of the important things about this is you have to have work that's worthy of going on the cover because it's representative of you and it could turn somebody off immediately if they don't like your work that's on the cover and not even let them inside. So you really have to think about what your work looks like when it goes on the cover. You know, I wouldn't pick this person in some modernist design institution. Like if I was working for a, a modernist firm, I, that, no, 
You know, so you got you to kind of think about what you're presenting to somebody. I think this is one of the best covers I've ever seen. It's a great, fantastic cover. I could never personally do this because my sketches never look that good. Compositionally, it's good. It's got strong diagonal. As we, as we look at something like this, it's like, oh, that's beautiful. And I'm so excited to see what this person's work is. So if you're good at this kind of sketching, then by all means, put this on the cover. But if you're not, don't just throw a sketch on the cover because you think it's going to make you look cool. Does that make sense? So you really have to think and, and control this sort of thing. This, this person is interested in landscape, so it makes sense that they're kind of featuring the landscape. I like this one, too. It's kind of a, a, a different take on it, the very dark with the, the light. So I would assume that this person is interested in light and how light goes through space, etc. So you're giving some clue about what this person would be about. And again, I haven't seen most of these portfolios anyway. So this one has the cityscape with the red tone behind it. And I'm not quite sure whether this is like, you know, they're going after the Walking Dead look or something. I, I, I don't quite know where he's going with this. Um, this wouldn't be my choice. But it is certainly a, a, a strategy uh, to cause your work to stand out. Another example with the sketches. And I think this one also works really nice and, and is really clean. Uh, but again, you have to be able to, to do this quality of sketch and then also kind of compose it. You can see that this is a photograph of a, of a piece of trace laying on top of another piece of trace. There's just a little bit of the photo here. There's a little bit of shadow. It's set up just right from a lighting standpoint, and then she snapped the picture. So it looks casual, but it's completely staged. And that's really important. Strong diagonal, everything's composed right. So if you're going to do something like this, you have to think very carefully about how everything's set up, what the angle is. It might take you several, if not 100, photos to get just the right angle with the right look, with the right cropping, and all the rest of it to, to, to have this show up really nice and clean. But it turned out really nice in the end. So it's definitely a strategy. It's a little bit more of like, I'm a student, and this is my work in progress, and I'm learning how to design, and, and it feels very uh, pro process-oriented as opposed to something that's more finished product oriented. I think one of the challenges with, uh, with something like this is it's the night render, which everybody wants to do the night render. But uh, for those of you that have taken my, my 136 class with Rhino, we talk a lot about lighting and how the night render is all about the light. And if you look at this, OK, there's a, this is really just a day render with a night background to it. All we have is a sunlight. We have no internal lights and, and whatever. So, if you're going to showcase something like this, especially on the cover, make sure you really know how to do it. You know, like Alex Holgraf could showcase something like this on his cover, and you'd be intrigued because it's so beautiful, because he really understands how to do night renderings. So just be aware of what you're showing and what it reflects on you. It's a cover. So text with a model background. So some people are inherently good at building models. And if you're really good at building models, it's a great place to put your models, would be on the cover. They're kind of abstract, but they can really showcase who you are and, and how you work. I had a, a student who sat next to me for a semester in grad school who did all of his design work through models. And I, it was exhausting to watch him. But every, we would have class, we'd, we'd have our four hour studio on Monday, and he would build between one and 10 models for Wednesday. And then we'd have our next meeting on Friday, and he'd build another one to 10 models. I mean, he just produced models. And it was always like these models. And they were kind of half finished, and they were exploring the design. But he never drew anything. He just built models. And so it would make complete sense in his portfolio to put a model on the cover and to show all these models and his process work. It's just how he thought and how he designed. Um, and so it's, it's kind of a, an interesting way of, of presenting your work and showing what it is that you're interested in. The other thing that people tend to like to do is they like to reveal part of the work underneath the cover. So you have to think about how you cut it out so that nothing falls out completely and that it's stable enough. Uh, these two examples were done in acrylic, so it's a little bit more of a rigid cover, though you could do it with like a watercolor or a, you know, I think a watercolor, 140 pound, 160 pound cold press would, would stand up to it a little bit. Um, but you have to think about one, what it is that you're cutting out, and two, what's showing from the underside. Because what shows through is really important 
as part of your cover. So you have to kind of script what the interior page looks like in addition to what the exterior page looks like. Another example here. So let's talk through binding options. I'll start first with the traditional options. This, what I mean by traditional is you walk into uh, FedEx, you walk into Staples, you walk into Office Max, and you say, I want you to bind this work or print and bind this work. Um, so there are traditional binding options. The first one is the spiral bound. Very common, very inexpensive. Essentially, it's a piece of plastic. Sometimes it's a piece of metal, but most often it's a piece of plastic uh, that looks kind of like a spring, and it, it, it binds one edge. It eats up about a quarter of an inch with those holes, so you're losing, you know, if you put text in the center there, you'd lose it. Uh, you're losing part of your image. The problem with this is that when you open the book, and I'll see if I can dig up an example so that you can see it. When you open the book, because of the spiral, one of the pages goes down and one of the pages goes up. So if you look at a spread, the flow line of the spread won't be the same. It'll be off-centered. And it really kills the, the design layout. So it's really good for a one-sided book, but not so much for a two-sided book. Uh, the next slide I have, this is not a portfolio, but I scoured trying to find something with strong flow lines so you could see what I'm talking about. So here we are in the spiral bind, and you can see that the flow lines across here at the bottom, you get to that center binding and they jump. Same thing happens with the black at the top where they jump and they're misaligned. So if you want to stick with the, the cheap, inexpensive binding, you can instead go toward a comb binding, which is the next one here, uh, which essentially keeps everything in alignment, which is nice. The plastic comb, which you can see examples of in the back, is kind of thick and chunky. It takes up a lot of, a lot of space. It's, it's, I don't know, it's heavy. Uh, for a long time, Staples had a metal comb binding that was really nice. It was kind of elegant. It wasn't too rigid, uh, but I think they discontinued it. So I, I haven't seen any nice metal comb bindings in a while. Uh, same thing, though. You lose about a quarter of an inch with all those hole punches. So you're losing content in the middle. Um, of that. But again, no alignment issues if you're going across a spread. There's an example of the, the metal combs. They're a little bit lighter weight and they feel a little bit better. So if you can find those, I think it uh, is a little bit nicer. Another example there. I have lots of examples of those. So then we move into the handmade or the specialty. So those were the ones that you can walk in. You can say, hey, can you bind this document for me? Can you print it and bind it? Um, there's a couple other ones. Let me see if I have one. I don't have any pictures of it. Mm, this one. This is the other one that they do. It's kind of like a, a strip of plastic that they punch through. There's a strip on the front and a strip on the back. Um, this one, it works nicely, but you can't lay the book completely flat. So as I open this, this portfolio like this, there's always going to be a fold to it. And so any image that's too far down in the, in the crease here, you're going to start to lose part of it because you can't open it all the way. So just be aware. But this one actually turns out pretty nice. And there's some good examples back here of people that have used that style binding. The other binding that's back here is this one, which is like a taped binding, which I think is really nice. The, the students who did this, um, he, it was before I asked that you put the sticker on the back saying where you had it printed. So I have no idea where he actually did this. But it's another option that, that somebody did for him with this little tape. Um, so be aware that that's there as well. So when we get into the specialty bindings, um, this is where you would go to a professional print house, something like this. This is actually uh, from ELS. This is um, Anthony Grand, who teaches 220. This is his uh, company. This was one of their recent books that they put together. They do a lot of pools and aquatic centers and whatever. Um, and I, I, he gave it to me as, a, as an example of, hey, this is what we're up to and whatever. But I think it's a perfect example of kind of a firm's portfolio. So it's very professionally done, it's professionally printed, it's professionally bound, so you can see what that kind of high-end example looks like. But also, if you spend time looking at it, you can see what all the flow lines are and how it all flows as a complete document, where the colors are, etc. So I really like it as an example. So it's worth checking out and looking at it. Um, I would consider this a specialty binding. The rest of these options that I'm going to talk about are all specialty bindings. 
When it comes to this kind of a portfolio, you can, of course, send it to uh, a professional online shop. They can bind it into a real book. Uh, you, can, you have a lot of those kinds of options. Not enough time for you to do it right now and not something that I would require to do. But it's something down the road. Maybe you're working in a firm where professional binding makes sense. Um, the one other thing that I'll point out for you guys, so here's a professional bound one. Um, just trying to think, let me go through. Yeah, something like this. Sometimes people actually hand sew theirs. I have two examples in the back here of hand sewn ones. Let's see if I can dig around here a little bit. If it didn't walk away. Oh, they're right next to each other. Perfect. So two examples of hand sewn ones. Um, this one was done several years ago. Um, and just in the interest of comparison, this was, she, she bound it, hand sewn, and she printed, in the, printed it here at school, and the whole thing cost about $5. So it's definitely on the cheaper end of this spectrum, but graphically it's really nicely done. It doesn't have special paper or anything like that, and she sewed the whole thing together, uh, and it, this binding has lasted which is kind of interesting. Um, I had one, I used to have my grad school portfolio back there, but somebody walked off with it, so it's not there anymore. Um, what I did is I, I took this, I printed it myself, uh, and then I stapled it right along the, the bound edge, and I flattened out the staples so they, they weren't sticking out at all. It was nice and flat. Uh, and then I took watercolor paper, and I, I made a cover and a back cover, and I scored lines so that it would fold on a perfect um, edge. And then I wrapped it around and I glued that into the spine. So it became essentially this style of a binding. So you can do something like that yourself should you want to. Uh, this is another example here of the hand sewn. Uh, this one is in here because of this um, and kind of that style of binding. That's certainly something that's an option uh, for you if you want to. Um, when, when, like in this, in this example with this student, he was very careful not to include, you know, you see that he's lost about three quarters of an inch because of that sewing. Uh, there is nothing inside the book that gets clipped by it. It's all designed with that space in mind. Uh, he also pre-folded all the pages. So if you, if you open the book to any particular page, it will lay pretty darn flat because everything's kind of been pre-creased that that's where it, it folds. So I encourage you, there's a reason I, I have all these in the back so that you guys can see them and, and play around with them and look at them, think about their bindings, open them up, etc. This one's really cool too. Uh, I wish I had this as a live example, uh, but it's bound in three places, so it kind of opens in, different, in a different way, uh, which is kind of fun. So I'm going to let you guys work today. Spend some time in the back, look at the portfolios, think about your binding, think about what, look, what goes on the cover, and then go from there. Okay? Any questions about anything? Remember, this is due on Monday, the 9th of December. So it's a week after next Monday. So it's like in two weeks. Okay? Yeah. For everybody or for you? Okay. <laughs>